Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to the Straight A Nursing Podcast. I am Nurse Mo, and this is episode 111. And today I'm talking to those of you that are getting ready to start nursing school with five things that I want you to do that I think will really help you be super successful as you embark on your journey to become a nurse. Okay, but before we do that, you guys know we always start our episodes with a quick listener shout out so that I can say hey to those of you that have been so kind to take a moment to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you use to get your podcast. So this one is written by Madison, who says, incredibly helpful. I love Nurse Mo's content. I am learning so much and her episodes help me to feel prepared for nursing school and also helps me to believe in myself. I'm starting my prereqs this year and plan on doing an accelerated nursing program since I already have a bachelor's degree. Nurse Mo, could you do an episode on passing pre-nursing courses like A&P, micro, and statistics? That would be super helpful. I'm so nervous for these classes and I know you'll have awesome advice. Madison, thank you so much for taking a moment to write that review. And let's see. So as far as anatomy and physiology go, I saved all my anatomy and physiology notes, Madison, and they are epically awesome. They're really good. I have to say they're good um, because they are. I'm a little proud of them. So they're on my website. If you go to the straightanursingstudent.com website, And I believe if you go to the resources tab, I'm in the process of um, restructuring and redesigning my website. So this could change. These instructions could change, but they'll be easy enough to find um, if you get there and you don't aren't able to follow these instructions exactly because I've moved things around between the time I record this and the time you do this. But go to the resources and go to pre-nursing notes and they're right there and they are so, so good. So I don't have them for microbiology. For microbiology, I would say have fun with it. I loved microbiology. I found it to be so, so interesting. I especially really loved the labs. And my best advice for microbiology lab is because you have to draw, we had to draw little pictures of our, you know, our Petri dishes and what it would grow. Take really good detailed drawings and that will help you when you're studying and when you're doing your lab practicums and are, you know, having to identify things for your exams. And then going back to anatomy and physiology for just a moment, I would say definitely don't fall behind. Um, A&P is a really content-heavy class, so you definitely don't want to fall behind. And it really depends on how your course is structured. Some people take all of anatomy in AP1 and then all of physiology in AP2. The school I went to did half of the body in AP1 anatomy and physiology, and then AP2 was the other half of the body um, in um, in that class. So it just depends because your studying is going to be different if you're learning anatomy versus if you're learning physiology. So if you're learning anatomy, here's how I studied my anatomy. So first of all, make use of lab time, like spend the whole time there. Don't rush through it just to get out and get home or go to the beach if it's a pretty day or whatever. Really make use of your time in anatomy lab make a friend also. So what I did was I made a friend in anatomy lab, Irene. I know she's not listening because she's not a nurse. She went to dental hygiene school, but she was the best study partner in the world. She was so great. We studied exactly the same way, which was super helpful. So Irene and I would get together and study a lot. So we made friends. That's Project number one, make a buddy in anatomy lab. And then if it's online, try to make a buddy over Zoom or something so that you have somebody to study with. And then when I was learning anatomy itself, I bought an atlas, which is a book that shows you all the body parts, all the bones, all the landmarks of the bones, all the muscles, all the everything in excruciating detail. And I made an answer sheet. So, um, well, first what I did was I got post-it notes and I cut them into little bitty tiny strips and I covered all of the names on the diagrams. 
And I numbered them one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, 30, 50, 100, however many there were. And then I made an answer sheet one, two, three, four, five, numbered them and wrote down what they were, what bone it was, what bone landmark it was, you know, whatever. And then I would practice with a fresh sheet of paper, labeling all of the parts that we had to know. And that is how I grilled myself with a lot of anatomy. With the muscles That was some hard stuff right there. And it gave me immense respect for physical therapists because I had to learn muscles a little bit. They have to learn muscles in excruciating detail. Like my brain doesn't even want to go into that much detail about the muscles. So what we had to learn with the muscles was, you know, obviously what it was called and where it was located, what it attached to, so what it, what it, its insertion point, and then where it would end up, like where it attached to on the other end, and then what it did. Did it externally rotate? Did it internally rotate? Did it flex? Did it extend? Just like the, the body mechanic of the muscle. So that was really hard because there were so many things we had to know about each muscle. It wasn't just knowing where the, you know, trapezius was versus the deltoid versus the quadricep. It was so much more than that. So what I did was I made a flashcard for each muscle. And then on the back, I wrote down all those things, you know, insertion, attachments and, uh, you know, mechanics, what it does, rotate, flex, extend, whatever. And I just went over and over and over and over and over them 8 million times. And I also would meet with Irene, who was wonderful, and we would quiz each other on those. And then the other way that I worked with my study buddy, Irene, was a lot of studying physiology. So we, I'm serious, we would sit at Panera Bread, camp out there, for like 12 hours. We were Panera campers. In our defense, we ate breakfast, lunch, and dinner there. We spent money. Um, But I really liked their, um, they had free coffee refills. And I like that hazelnut coffee that they have. It's so good. So anyway, we would meet at Panera, which was the main place we would meet. We'd bring our A&P books and our, you know, all of our stuff. And we would go through our notes, our study guides or whatever for the exam, and we would take turns teaching it to the other person, talking through the physiology concepts. And that is how we really, really, really learned physiology. And we did awesome in that class. So um, that is just one way to study a and that worked really well for me. The other thing that I did, and you'll see it in my notes if you go and download them, is that I rewrote my notes and I wrote them in a paragraph format in a way that I could understand. You cannot rely on PowerPoint bullet points to study something like physiology. So take your lecture, jot down your notes, and then you want to rewrite them into paragraph narrative format, you know, like you're trying to explain a concept to a friend. That's what I always say. So that was my good advice for that. And then for statistics, I will send you all the good vibes in the world. I liked statistics, but it was definitely the class where I I thought I might not get an A in this class. I might get an A minus. So I was really nervous about it. But um, stats was hard. It was really interesting, though. The thing with stats is if you have a good teacher, you will be fine. You will get through it. You have to do a ton of practice. Don't, you know, any math class, you just have to practice. So get as much practice as you can. Participate in class. Ask questions. Ask for examples. And stay really engaged with the class as much as you can. Hopefully it's not taught like... um you know, them just giving you reading and having you do problems. Hopefully you have someone lecturing that you can engage with over, you know, Zoom or in person. So those are my tips for statistics. And then if you have to do a project in stats, we had to do a little project. Just pick something that you find interesting so that you're, you know, you're a little more into it than just picking some random thing that you're not at all interested in. I did something with nutrition. I don't remember what it was exactly, but it had something to do with nutrition and healthy eating and statistics around that. Okay, so that was my uh, answer to Madison. Since you took the time to write that nice review, I wanted to take a moment to provide you with some help for the questions that you were asking.
Okay, so this episode today, again, is for all of you brand new students, and we're going to talk about five things to do while you're on your break waiting for classes to start. Five things, okay? Are you ready? I know you guys are ready. Okay, I'm ready too. All right, so the first thing that I want you guys to do, and you're going to laugh at me, uh, well, not really laugh, but you're going, you're going to resist maybe a little bit. But the first thing that I want you to do is I want you to do some reading. And I'm not talking about heavy reading. I'm talking about go and get yourself some trashy novels or some guilty pleasure reading and dive in head first because you are not going to be doing any of that for a while. And I want you to just relish it and enjoy it. Okay. So promise me that you will read at least two guilty pleasure, trashy books, whatever that is for you before school starts. Okay. If school starts next week, you're not going to be able to fit two in, but read one. Okay. Just get a short, really good trashy one and just read it. Just guilty pleasure reading, you guys, is the thing I missed the absolute most when I was in nursing school. But then I'm also going to ask you to do some reading that will inspire and engage you and prepare you for school and get you in the right mindset, okay? So first and foremost, I have to recommend my book, Nursing School Thrive Guide. It's set up for you, the student going into nursing school to help set you up for success, okay? You can get that on Amazon as a paperback, as an ebook, like for Kindle, or an audiobook. So you can have it any old way that you like it. And I just know that it will help you. I've gotten a lot of really great feedback on it. I will be updating that book soon. Probably not until... I get a couple more big projects done for you guys, but it is on the horizon. Okay, so there's that. And then I want to highly recommend the book Becoming Nursey by Katie Clever. She is awesome. She has the Fresh RN website and podcast. So Katie is great. Her book is wonderful. That's another one that I would highly recommend that you get. And then... um Just nurse inspiration books, you guys. So some of them are um, one of the ones I read early on. It's an older book, but it's so good. Her name is Echo Heron. Um, Echo, just like, you know, Echo, Echo, Echo. And then Heron, H-E-R-O-N. And the book I loved from her, and she, I think she wrote several, but the book I'm thinking of specifically is called Intensive Care. And... um, a story of a nurse. That's right. I knew I had a subtitle. Intensive Care, A Story of a Nurse. And it's by Echo Heron. And it's so good. And it was one of the first books I read that made me think, hmm, maybe this is a career that I would be interested in. And then the next one I read that really tipped me in that direction was by Tilda Shaloff. And that book is called The Making of a Nurse. It is excellent. So check that one out. And then there's another one that I I have I I've either read it or heard so many good things about it. I feel like I've read it. And that one's called I Wasn't Strong Like This When I Started Out. And that's by Lee Gutkind. Gutkind. I'm not sure how she pronounces her last name, but I wasn't strong like this when I started out. And um, if you go to Amazon and just look for any of those that they're going to recommend all these other inspiration on nurse books, those are the three that I can speak to specifically, along with Katie's book, and then of course, the Nursing School Thrive Guide. So that should keep you pretty busy, but make sure you put some trash in there somewhere, you guys read something, you know, for me, um, I call it trash reading, it's not because it's all joy. And so I shouldn't I shouldn't disparage any of that anybody's joy. But for me, my my guilty pleasure reading, let's call it that, are things like murder mysteries and thrillers and um, things that are a little bit on the dark side. I just really love that kind of stuff. Um, For my friend, it's like romances and things like that. So whatever that is for you, go for it. I'm reading one right now about the, what's it called? The Sunset Sundown Motel, Sunset Motel, something like that. It's turning out to be very good. So anyway, and then there's another one called, um, it's about a nurse, um, The Good Nurse. And it's this true story, you guys, about this nurse that was a serial killer, Charles somebody, I think. And I read it in like a day. It was just, I just ate it up. It was so good and twisted. And he got caught, by the way. 
thank goodness. Um, it's called The Good Nurse. It's really good. Pathological, if you like that kind of stuff. Okay, so reading for pleasure and inspiration because you won't have time. And I just want you to start with your tank on full in that way. Okay. And then the second thing to do if you're starting nursing school soon in the next few weeks, in the next semester, whatever that is, is you should do some purposeful review. So in my course, Crucial Concepts Boot Camp, we review some of the key things um, in, in some detail. Um, before nursing school starts, the key things that you need to know. So if you're interested in getting a little bit more guidance and a little bit more of that step-by-step -step in preparing for nursing school, then Crucial Concepts Boot Camp is definitely something that you'll want to look at. And I'll link to it in the show notes and on the uh, web page associated with this podcast episode. But you can just go to straightanursingstudent.com and click on boot camp and it'll take you right there. So let's talk about some of those topics from A&P that if you review and have kind of fresh in your mind, you'll be more prepared and more ripe for the learning that you're going to get. And some of the concepts that are introduced to you in school are going to click a little faster if you can remind yourself of some of that stuff you worked so hard to learn in anatomy and physiology, which is the main the main course that we're reviewing from. So uh, you definitely want to look at fluids, fluid compartments, fluid shifts in the body, fluid movement, pressure gradients, osmosis, stuff like that. Um, oncotic pressure, osmolarity, all of that kind of stuff is going to come into play a lot with your patients. So if you review nothing else and you just did that, you would be able to understand a good portion of why we choose certain IV fluids for certain patients in different conditions. And that's a big topic in first semester and a source of a lot of confusion and frustration for students as they struggle to learn it. But if you've got this core knowledge refreshed in your mind, you're going to do so much better and have so much less stress. Okay, so fluids, pressure gradients, osmolarity, osmosis, oncotic pressure, all that kind of stuff. Review that, okay? And then the renal system, you want to take a quick walk through your renal system. I'm not saying you need to go into that minutia of detail with all the different pressures in the tubules and the reabsorption of this and the bleh. That was mind-numbing, okay? You do need to know a little bit like maybe about, you know, the loop and what happens there and whatnot. But just review the renal system. I want you to understand um, how the renal system affects blood pressure, hemodynamics, fluid balance, um, tissue perfusion, infection, how all of that kind of relates to the kidneys and the renal system. Um, definitely... When you're looking at the tubules and your electrolyte levels, review that. You don't need to, again, memorize it, but just know about the key things, okay? There's some shifts here with potassium and sodium and bicarb and all that stuff. So you want to kind of review that, okay? And then I want you to look at the RAS system. The RAS system, R-A-A-S, is one of those things that I tend to have to refresh myself on pretty regularly. So take a look at that, review that. That's that renin, aldosterone, angiotensin, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So R-A-A-S, get that kind of fresh in your mind and you'll be doing pretty good. Definitely take a look at electrolytes. You want to understand the roles they play, you know, their functions in the body why high levels, you know, can cause bad things to happen for your patient as well as low levels for your patient. So reviewing that stuff is really important. And um, I have cheat sheets for that available, which I can link to. And then we also review electrolytes in my Crucial Concepts Boot Camp as well. Um, dimensional analysis. So most of you learned it in chemistry. I would feel like you probably did. I feel like it's pretty um, standard to learn in chemistry. So if you can review the basics of dimensional analysis, you'll be using it 
most of you, well, I recommend using it for dosage calculations. There's other ways to do dosage calculations, but I find dimensional analysis is one way. You don't have to memorize any formulas. It's super easy. It's just a method that you use um, to do your dosage calculations. So if you remember kind of the basics of dimensional analysis and your metric conversions, you'll be ready and raring to go to learn dosage calculations. I also teach dosage calculations in my Crucial Concepts boot camp. Um, I also teach it as a standalone. If you're not, if you don't need the whole boot camp, you just want to focus on dosage calculations, that's available as well. Okay, cardiovascular physiology. You definitely want to review physiology of the heart. You need to look over that pathway of blood flow through the heart that's going to help you really understand the pathophysiology of, of like valve disorders, things like that. You need to review the basic anatomy of the heart, especially, you know, like knowing which coronary arteries are supplying oxygen to different parts of the heart come into play a lot when you're looking at um, a QMI and the parts of the heart that are affected for your patient is has to do with which arteries are occluded or not working properly. Maybe they're kinked. I do know someone who's, um, was it their, I think it was one of the main arteries in their heart. It was like a physiological defect, kinked, okay? Had a huge MI from it and ended up having to have a, a bypass. So anyway, and very interesting. So it's not always an occlusion from, you know, poor diet and poor lifestyle choices. Some people, it's just physiologically that way. Just that was a little aside. Sorry to go off on the tangent. You also want to review, you know, that balance between stroke volume, heart rate, cardiac output, review that. And I, so going back to the pathway of blood through the heart, I made what I think is a very clever mnemonic. I don't like to rely on mnemonics, but sometimes they're good for when you just need a little nudge to think of something in the right way, and then it triggers you to remember the whole thing. So I made a mnemonic, you guys. I have to share it with you because I think it's so good. So if you're somewhere where you can write this down, you might want to write this down. I posted it in our uh, Facebook group, the Thriving Nursing Students Facebook group, but I'll put it in... Um, well, I think that's as good a place for it as any. So here it is. It's in some really trendy resorts, people play loud, perfect lullabies, making lads and adults sleep. How good was that, right? So in some really trendy resorts, people play loud, perfect lullabies, making lads and adults sleep. So that's that whole flow of blood through the heart, right? So let's just review that real quick since we're here, okay? The eye is the inferior vena cava, and the S is the superior vena cava. In sum, inferior vena cava, superior vena cava. This is the blood coming into the heart through those large vessels. And then it goes into the right atrium, through the tricuspid valve, into the right ventricle. So in our little mnemonic, we're at in some really trendy resorts. So the first letter, I-S-R-T-R is inferior, superior, and then right atrium, tricuspid valve, right ventricle. And then from the right ventricle, it's going to go through the pulmonic valve, out to that pulmonary artery, and then into the lungs, and then into the pulmonary veins, into the left atrium, and then through the mitral valve, into the left ventricle, and then up through the aortic valve, out into the aorta, and then out into systemic circulation. So I'll have this picture. I will, you know what? I will put it on the website at straightynursingstudent.com. I will do that. So if you go to straightynursingstudent.com forward slash, what episode are we on? Forward slash 111, it will be there for you. Okay. So that was a quick review of the blood flow through the heart. And you definitely want to review that and know that pretty solidly. Also take a look at respiratory physiology, looking at gas exchange. You want to understand, you know, 
oxygenation, perfusion, ventilation, like those kinds of concepts. I did do a recent podcast episode on those. Let me see if I can find that um, episode number for you guys so that you don't have to go hunting for it. But that's going to come in really handy when you're learning about um, patients right from the get-go because respiratory um, malfunction disorders is going to be one of the first topics that you talk about in your med surge course. And that was episode 89. So if you're going back and you want to listen to that, that would be extremely helpful to know. And then acid base balance, another one that is huge. We also go over this in my Crucial Concepts Bootcamp, by the way. So you want to definitely review acid-base balance, what that means, the pH, alkaline, acidotic. If you learned how to analyze ABGs in your a and P class you may have, you may not have. Um, if you did learn, review that a little bit. Otherwise, you'll learn it in nursing school. And then, so that's it for review. Those are the main things to review. I know it kind of seems like a lot, and I'll have this list on the uh, website. Um, again, just go to straightynursingstudent.com forward slash 111, and it'll be there for you. Okay, so the next thing to do, number three, before you start school is you got to start school with the right supplies, you guys. You don't want to be um, scrambling at the last minute to get the things that you need. So hopefully your school will let you know what things they require of you, you know, that might be a stethoscope or a watch or whatever. So you definitely want to get those things. If you start shopping early, you might be able to find some good deals. Get a stethoscope. Don't break the bank on your stethoscope. I just, I've always used a Littman Master Classic 2. I know there's some students out there that go big, big gangbusters and get a cardiology one right out of the gate. I find that to be a little bit expensive, but if you've got the money and you don't mind losing it, then that's fine. But um, get a stethoscope. You know, hopefully you don't lose it. I'm not saying you're going to lose it. I'm just saying that they tend to disappear sometimes. Um, I got a Littman Master Classic 2 as a gift, and it lasted me probably eight to nine years and then I it got old and funky so I got rid of it and then I bought a new one immediately lost it had to buy another one and then found the one I had lost so I have two now so that's fine I have two okay so getting a stethoscope getting a watch I use an apple watch but some schools don't allow that because I don't know if they think you're going to record things in the clinical setting I have no idea if you're getting an analog watch you want one with a second hand preferably a second hand that sweeps so when they say the second hand is sweeping, when you look at it, it goes around the watch face smoothly. It doesn't jump, jump, jump from one second to the next. That jump, jump, jump could distract you as you're counting a heart rate. So you just want that sweeping second hand. Ideally, it will glow in the dark and be washable. So I had a Swiss Army watch that I loved, loved, loved. It met all those criteria. It was absolutely wonderful. I wore the heck out of that until I got my Apple Watch. And even now the Apple Watch kind of bugs me sometimes because I'll be trying to count someone's respirations and it'll go uh, to sleep on me. So I tried to make it so that it wouldn't go to sleep so quickly. And sometimes it works. Um, I like it because I can set timers on it and set reminders for myself. So that's why I really like my Apple watch, but a perfectly um, functional analog watch like the Swiss army watch that I use. And I'm sure there's plenty of others would be just absolutely fine. You also definitely want to get comfortable shoes for clinical. If you are in the thriving nursing students, Facebook group, there's many, many conversations about shoes. Just go there and search for shoes. I eventually did make a dedicated area for that conversation because there were so many, but you can definitely get a ton of advice that's already there. You don't even have to ask. It's there. And um, if you're not in the Thriving Nursing Students group, then what are you waiting for? Come check it out. And then um, some schools will stipulate they have to be all white, they have to be all black, they have to be all leather, blah, blah, blah. Make sure you know the stipulations and the requirements before you go drop, you know, $80 on a pair of shoes. I don't know why shoes are so expensive, but they are. And then um, the other thing that I would say you're going to use a lot is uh, I would recommend a laptop just because it's mobile. 
But if you have a desktop and you don't want to spend the money for a second computer, then you can, I'm sure you can get by with just your desktop. I just took my laptop with me everywhere and it was really nice to have that, but it's absolutely not a requirement. But you are going to need some kind of a computer, especially if you're doing a lot of distance learning and um, taking classes online. I have a whole, uh, post on my website about all the other miscellaneous supplies you might need. I list a lot of those out in the uh, course as well as my book. You can also uh, get that information there. So if you go to my website um, to the straightingnursingstudent.com forward slash 111, I'll link to the post where I list out ad nauseum all the many, many, you know, smaller items like that I found useful, like a mini stapler and a mini hole punch and just random things that you might not think about. But I would say those four things. Oh, I didn't say a good backpack. Sorry. You need a solid backpack, you guys. Um, I used a rolling backpack. I'm not too proud to use a rolling backpack. It saved me. And I never had to decide like, oh, do I want to take this with me? It's so heavy. Nope. I just put it in there and I was able to have what I needed with me all the time. So a good rolling backpack, a decent stethoscope, comfortable good shoes for clinical, and some kind of computer, preferably laptop. But if it's, you know, going to break the bank, then I wouldn't deal with it. I would just use the desktop that I have. Okay. Um, some students use an iPad. Those are great or a tablet. That's great. A lot of schools will not let you do assessments on those. Like if you're doing a proctored exam, you have to be on a desktop or a laptop. I think it's just because of the software that is utilized. So just make sure that if you are choosing between a computer and a tablet, that you understand that the tablet might not fulfill the requirements for your program. Okay, so that was item three, get your core supplies before classes start. You don't want to be scrambling, going shoe shopping when you need to be home studying, okay? Even though shoe shopping is really fun. Okay, item number four is I want to have you start getting into the practice of listening to some nursing podcasts. Okay, so we have my podcast. Obviously, you're listening to it right now, but there are others and you can get a lot of, um, you could do a lot of learning in this way. And I just want you to try it out. So the Fresh RN podcast by Katie Clever is absolutely great. Um, nursing has a podcast um, called Nursing. And then uh, Real Talk School of Nursing is great. He's an ER nurse, ex-military, has just, you know, real frank discussions about nursing school and uh, working as a nurse, whereas I'm more focused on, you know, providing education. Michael's more like, okay, here, I'm going to tell you the real deal. So I would check that out. And then when you're in your advanced med surge, you guys, if you're just starting, you're probably not there yet. But when you're in advanced med surge, I highly recommend the podcast called ICU Rounds. I learned a lot from that. It's by this uh, burn doctor, Dr. Guy. And I just learned a lot about ventilator weaning and, and just things that patients in the critical care environment deal with. I didn't understand all of it, but I heard it and then I might hear it again in lecture and it would just connect a little bit more. So I found that to be really interesting. So, um, and before school starts, I would also highly recommend, you know, just like I recommended doing some guilty pleasure reading, how about some guilty pleasure podcast listening as well? So um, my favorites aren't necessarily going to be your favorites, but if you like true crime and stuff like that, stuff that's kind of weird, I love the podcast. Ooh, my favorite murder is a really good one. These two girls talk about true crime stuff, but they're kind of funny and interesting and engaging while they do that. Um, stuff you should know, I mentioned... In a couple podcasts ago, when I was talking about toxoplasmosis, Dirty John was probably the most well done podcast I've ever listened to. And I listened to a ton of podcasts, you guys. I absolutely loved that. I think they ended up making a Netflix show out of it. It's a true story. And then um, Serial was also another really good one. I didn't love, I have to be honest, I didn't love the second season. I don't know if she's done a third. No, I think she is doing a third, but I'm not into it. The first season... Mm, was so perfect, so good. So those are just some of my recommendations there, okay? Um, all right, number five, are you ready? So the fifth thing to do before nursing school starts is recharge your batteries, refresh and re 
new. So most likely you're coming off of a lot of stress, a lot of adrenaline. You had to crush your prerequisites, especially if you're in um, a competitive program where you had to have straight A's or you didn't have a chance of getting in or, you know, close to that. Um, Even if you didn't have to get straight A's, I know you still worked your tail off to get through your prerequisite courses because you're dedicated and you're committed to this career path and that's what it takes. So you're coming off of a lot of hard work and I just want you to kind of just relax for a little bit because it's going to hit and it's going to hit really hard when school starts and your tank has got to be full, you guys. So I talk about self-care periodically. I truly, truly believe in it. I know when school starts, you're not going to have as much time to devote to things that bring you joy and uh, enable you to relax and refresh and get away a little bit. So do that now. See your friends as much as you can. See your friends. I'm recording this at a time of social distancing. Um, so you might not get to see them as much, but you know, if you can go to a socially distant picnic in somebody's backyard, you know, do what you need to do to connect with the people that matter the most to you. Hang out with your family. Do fun things together as a family. Um, If you thought about a hobby while you were doing your prerequisites and you didn't have time for it, maybe explore that a little bit before school starts. Um, Watch, binge watch movies, you know, see what is on. um, Do like free trials of Netflix and Hulu and all of that and just watch as many movies and TV shows as you can. So I just want you to enjoy yourself, get outside, do a physical activity, get yourself so that you feel prepared for the onslaught of stuff that's coming at you when school actually starts because it's going to be intense and I know you're going to totally crush it, but you need to be at the top of your game and ready for whatever nursing school throws your way. So those are the five things that I would love for you to do before nursing school starts. And then along with that, of course, you know, I mentioned listening to podcasts. So I want you to check back in next week. And next week, we're talking about capnography. So capnography is something that you may use for a semester. You may see it more in your advanced med cert, but it's really interesting. And I would like to tell you a little bit about that. So I'll see you back here next week. And you guys have a fabulous week. Okay, bye-bye. This podcast is brought to you by Straight A Nursing.